Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the Lindenberg Public Library. I'm so glad to see you here today. I'm glad to see the turnout. I'm pretty excited about this, this presentation. I'd also like to uh, take a minute to thank the library director and his staff and the Lunenburg Public Access channel who's taping it for us tonight. Uh, everybody contributed to making tonight happen. And thank you very much for your help. Tonight we are really, oh, let me just do some house cleaning first. Um, in a week, we're having a special program, Walking to Listen. It's a talk with Andrew Forstall. First of all. First of all. And like his knees. First of all. First of all. Yeah. And <laughs> it's a young man who went walking for a year after he graduated uh, across the country, after he graduated from college, and he had some wonderful lessons on uh, listening to one another. He walked across the country and he wore a sign that said, I'm, I'm, I'm walking to listen. And he wrote a book and he even talks about all of his experiences meeting people that he probably would never have met in his everyday life and, and some of the lessons he learned. So if you want to sign up for that, there's still space. But tonight, we're very fortunate to have Robert to here with us. He is the director of the Jagir Laboratory at Worcester Polytechnic Institute's Department of Biology and Biotechnology. I had to read that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been a change. Surprise! <laughs> 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 okay. these okay. talks well in advance. So as of June 1st, I'm in the Department of Biology at UMass Dartmouth. Uh, so I'm uh, very excited about my new Congratulations. Yes. So, I'm hoping this is still accurate. He studies the behavior. <laughs> when, talking about birds tonight. <laughs> <laughs> he studies plant and pollinator interactions, how they work together. And uh, tonight he's here to share his knowledge and expertise. Uh, with us, we can learn about native bees and what we can do to help them hear where we live. Um, I personally am excited about tonight. I've been using uh, the Beecology app, which um, he created, and it's, um, he'll tell you all about it, but I've been using it to identify bees in my yard, learn about them, uh, learn about the behavior, and I report it to him, and he is able to keep track of this and measure how bees are doing. So thank you very much for driving here and sharing your time and your expertise with us tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, so hello, it's a, a pleasure to be here. I know that the title of my talk says ecology, which implies we talk about bees. Uh, but really what I'm talking about is biodiversity conservation. Uh, how is it that um, you can help to restore and protect biodiversity in your own backyard? Um, the, so, so what I plan to do, and one of my goals for tonight is, is to help you to understand how we go from pollinators to biodiversity. So not just bees, but you know, butterflies, flies, all of these insects are important. Um, pollinators are diff of different native plants, which in turn supports uh, wildlife diversity. So I'm going to talk about the Ecology Project, um, give you a little bit of background about some of the problems um, that I see with the current pollinator conservation efforts, um, and then go into some of the costs of some of the things that uh, we're doing to figure out what's going on with the pollinators, why they're declining, uh, and then uh, what you can do to help. So the Ecology Project, as you can see, is a citizen science project. I'm one person with maybe a couple of grad students, and I'm trying to collect data from across the state. Very difficult to do. And um, so I'm trying to recruit citizen scientists, as yourselves, to help to, to collect data. 
I started the project in 2016, and since that time, um, I've been amazed at, at, at the response and how much data I've been able to collect, and we really, we're really getting a handle on what's going on with uh, many of the species that are, are um, headed for extinction, uh, not just in the state, but, but in eastern North America. We can apply those same ideas, um, not just across the country, but also, also around the world. I have some handouts at the end. So based on our research, I have plant lists. So if you want to uh, help to restore biodiversity, what, what do I plant is the question. So the, a lot of the, the conservation groups have done a great job at increasing public awareness about pollinators. I'm sure you've all heard about pollinator decline. I'm sure immediately honeybees come to mind. I'm going to separate honeybees from, from everything else. Honeybees have an important role in one context. There's a whole other context that, that um, that really hasn't received much attention, and that's what the focus of the ecology project is. Uh, and also, I have some handouts on bumblebees, so I'm going to use bumblebees as an example of how you can, can help to, um, to collect data so you can figure out um, what, what's going on uh, with not just declines in pollinators, but the corresponding the parallel declines in native plants and also biodiversity that's, that all these things um, support. So I'm going to start by defining the problem. There are a few problems um, that I saw that, that the, ecology problem, uh, the ecology project addresses. So I'm going to go over those so you have a good understanding. There's a, a lot going on in the pollinator, um, with, with the pollinator decline issue. There's two, two really two sides to the issue. One's in agriculture and one's in, in, in ecology. And the two are very separate. And, um, and so I'll talk a bit about that. And you'll notice here I'm using the, the term pollination system instead of pollinator. So there's a lot of effort on pollinators, which is the animal, but poll the term pollinator is actually a plant-based term, and what's lost in all of the, the pollinator conservation uh, efforts is, is the plant and that interaction between the pollinators and the plants. And together they make up a pollination system, which is the foundation of the ecosystem. And we'll talk a little about that. So why are they important? Then I'm going to talk about how, what, in terms of research, what do we need to do to figure out what the mechanisms are? Is it pesticides? Is it climate change? How is it that we, we um, conduct research to figure out what these mechanisms are? And then using the data, how is it that we develop more effective solutions, more effective conservation strategies? Um, and here, you know, I'll talk about what's, what's called evidence-based uh, ecological conservation. It, it, um, um, so I'll, I'll get some more into, into that so later on in the talk. So to start things off, what is a pollinator? Seems like a pretty straightforward um, question. I'm sure many of you have an answer. Um, but there, there are a couple of uh, components and aspects of, of the, the definition of pollinator that people seem to miss and that are really important for us to understand how pollinators are linked to biodiversity. So pollinator, as I said, is a plant-based term. So most uh, uh, flowering plants need, um, in order to reproduce, they need pollen, which we can think of as the male gametes, transferred to the surface of the female reproductive organ, which is called the stigma. Once it attaches, a pollen tube grows down, and we get fertilization taking place. Once fertilization takes place, we get further development, production of seeds and fruit, and, and the, the cycle continues. In this figure, you see that the, the pollen is located, so the pollen just has to fall from, from the stamens right onto the stigma. And this is an, uh, an, an oversimplified diagram. There are some plant species that have it set up this way. Um, but the problem with this is if you are um, depositing your own pollen, fertilizing your own eggs, you're really mating with yourself. And this is an issue. So when this happens, it's called sulfate. And, and it reduces genetic variation, and you know, we have laws. Um, you know, the reason we can't mate with our, our close relatives, other than the, the social reasons, uh, genetically, um, we have an increased chance of getting um, mutations that will cause birth, birth defects and different, different things. So it's the same thing in the plants, although there are some plants that are self-compatible, meaning they can mate with themselves, and if they need to, most are what's called self-incompatible, which means the pollen needs to be taken from uh, the plant and then deposited on the flower uh, of another plant of the same species. And this is called outcrossing. If the pollen is deposited on the uh, flower of another plant species, two things happen. The first thing is that the pollen is effectively wasted, right? You're trying to mate with another species. That's not going to work out, so you're wasting your male gametes. 
for the, the, the uh, recipient flower, what happens is that the, the, uh, the, the heterospecific pollen, the pollen from the other species, blocks the surface of the stigma and prevents it from receiving its own pollen, preventing fertilization from taking place. So there are two costs if pollens moved to, uh, from one species to another species. There's the male cost, right? Male fitness, which is um, losing the, uh, the pollen. And also there's a, a cost to female fitness. You get have fewer um, for fertilization events taking place. So the plants really want, there's been strong selection for plants to get their pollen to move to um, the flowers of another plant. Most, most plant species are, are like this. So how is it that they do that? Some use the wind, and some use the, the water to complete that process. Now, what's the problem with the wind? If I want to mate with that plant over there, and the wind's blowing in this direction, my pollen's going to go over here, and I'm not going to be able to complete the, the fertilization process. So most plants, to get around this, use animals. 95% of plants or so, uh, flowering plants, use animals to complete this process. An animal that does complete that process, so transferring pollen, leading to fertilization is called a pollinator. If the animal moves from this flower to this flower, it is not a pollinator, all right? It's a flower visitor. So animals are using the flowers as a source of food, so they're, they're, they're feeding on the nectar, some feed on oils, they're eating the pollen. Um, but to be considered a pollinator, they have to complete the process of pollination. And, and this is, this is a, a major point. A lot of, um, We'll see a lot of animals on flowers uh, feeding, but that doesn't mean that they're pollinators. And, that, and that's important when we start to think about the importance of the pollination event itself, whether it be in an agricultural context or whether it be in an ecological context, which we'll get to in a second. <coughs> so how many plant species are we talking about? Worldwide, about 300,000 plant species are animal pollinated. Not surprisingly, there are about 200,000 animals that use flowers as a source of food, other nectar, pollen, both oils and oils, various things. We look at this, uh, this is from a postage stamp from a few years ago. You notice that there are small mammals, there's a bat, and there's a hummingbird. Of the 200,000 species, only 1,000 are vertebrates. So the vast majority um, of them uh, do not have a backbone. You can see there's a, there's a single bee here, there's a wasp, there's a beetle down here. Um, but this single bee represents, in North America alone, 4,000 different species, 4,000 different, 4, different kinds of bees. There are um, thousands of species of butterfly, and wasps, and flies, and beetles. And each one of those is paired up with something on this side. So there isn't a single animal on this side that can do all the, the pollination on this side, and there isn't a single plant species on this side that can feed everything on this side. Everything is matched up together. So a subset of uh, individuals or species from this side is matched up with a subset of individuals on this side. And the two of those have co-evolved with each other. So our native plants um, have adaptations, the, the way that their flowers look and smell, that try to attract and exploit their most effective pollinator on this side, which is a subset of pollinators. So we have bumblebee pollinated native plants. We have fly pollinated native plants. If we don't have those, that, those animals, and it might get right down to the species level, we need a specific bumblebee species to do the pollinating. And then this side doesn't get, um, uh, can't reproduce, and that's going to affect the population. Similarly, uh, on this side, if they, they're tuned to exploit certain types of flowers, they vary in tongue length. So long tongue bees match up with tubular flowers. Short tongue bees match up with flowers that are shallow, like a composite type flower. If they don't have that type of flower, they can't compete for food, and they're going to get outcompeted, and the population is going to go down. All right. So that you can think of this, both of these together, are what we call a pollination system. When we have the animal, the pollinator, and we have the plant together working together, that's a pollination system. And both of those things are important. You can't have one without the other. We reduce the plants, then we get the animals reducing, and if we reduce the animals, then we get the plants reproducing because there are uh, the populations. Um, decreasing because they don't, they don't have the pollinators that they that they need. How many different types of pollinators? And again, each one of these corresponds to a subset of plants. So bumblebees. I'm going to kind of focus on bumblebees today, and I'll you know give you a handout so you can ID the species in your backyard and, and direct you to the website so you can learn a bit more about them. Uh, there are 50 species in North America. There are 25 in the east and 25 in the west. Historically, in Massachusetts, we had 11. 
We have nine right now. Um, and some of those are, we're, we're going to have about seven in, in about in five to ten years if we don't do something about it. Carpenter bees, these are the ones that um, biting holes in your, in your deck, causing disturbance. There are 33 different yep. um, species of carpenter bee in North America. Mining bees, these are the smaller bees, these beautiful sweat bees. Um, you can barely see them. You have to sort of stop and, and take a look and maybe get, get a magnifying glass. But there are 520 species of, of, of these sweat bees. So lots and lots of, of species that you would think is a fly or you, you wouldn't notice it as a bee, that's how small they are. Moss and butterflies, you know, thousands of species of moss and butterflies. Uh, serpent flies, 900 species, a lot of these look like either a wasp or they look like bees, so they're bee mimics. Wasps actually are good pollinators of, of many things as well, such as this um, milkweed. And even beetles are important pollinators. So, you know, in the pollinator decline, we hear, hear about um, save the bees and all this. It's, it's really biased in that direction. It's not just save the bees. Typically, people are referring to save the honeybee, which is one species. Meanwhile, we have, as I said, 4,000 bee species that are all equally important, but we also have butterflies. All of these things are equally important um, in terms of the eco ecosystem and, and biodiversity. And wh why is that? Because, so if we look at some of these systems, here's a hummingbird pollination system. The, the nectar is located down here that the bird's trying to, to drink. That's its, its source of carbohydrate. You'll notice that as it's drinking, it's getting hit in the forehead with pollen. So uh, why is it hit in the forehead? Why, is the, why did the plant evolve a mechanism to deposit the pollen in the forehead of the hummingbird? Because if it deposited it on the wings, what would happen? You know how quickly a hummingbird beats its wings? That's really inefficient pollen transfer. <laughs> So it goes to the forehead, the, the, the hummingbird can't get at, the, at its forehead very well. It goes to the next flower, to the flower for another plant. As it moves down into position, here's the female part. So its forehead brushes up against the female part, depositing the pollen. We get the pollen tube of fertilization. And then as it continues, it picks up pollen, feeds, and then goes and completes the process again. So, you know, plants really don't get the... the um, you know, appreciation that they deserve. They have evolved a wide variety of different mechanisms to get their pollen to the right place and to exploit animals, not just what they what the animals look like, but also exploiting limitations on their sensory and their cognitive abilities. So bees are really smart, but plants are smarter. They've outsmarted them in, in order to get them to deposit pollen in the way that the benefits the plant. Um, and that's the whole other area of my research. It's called, called neuroecology. But understanding the way that bees think and, and hummingbirds think and how they use resources and how plants are exploiting those limitations really help us to understand what we need to do to help to, to, to conserve them. Here's a bumblebee pollination system, um, um, bumblebee on penstemon. This is the female part. The male part's located up here. The pollen's deposited on the, on the back of the bee, on the thorax of the bee. Why? Because, you know, if you have an itch in the middle of your back, it's very difficult to get to it, right? You need to get one of those back scratchers to get to it. Same thing with the bees. They can't get to the pollen. That means that the pollen is going to get transferred to um, the flower, and a lot of it isn't going to be lost to the bee. Now, bees are interesting because they're eating the pollen as well. Hummingbirds aren't eating the pollen. So, again, there's a battle between the bee and the plant. The bee wants to eat everything, and the plant wants to make sure that the bee transfers as much as possible and takes as little as possible. Um, a lot of people think that the interaction, like pollinator-plant interactions, it's this beautiful mutualism where, you know, the, the, um, the plant feeds the animal and the animal helps the plant to reproduce, but it's absolutely not like that. It's a conflict. There's a battle going on between the animals and the plants. A bee does not care that the plant gets reproduces. Um, and, and to be honest, the, and the um, plant doesn't care that the, uh, that the bee gets something to eat. It only does so to entice it to help it to reproduce, right? So nectar is produced. It, 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 it doesn't benefit the plant directly, but it certainly benefits it indirectly because it's helping to keep those pollinators and getting them to go to, to plants. And, and so, um, and that's not just with bees, that's with all these pollination systems. Here's a specialized system with a fly. Here's the fly. Here's, the, here's its match in, in the flower. Notice that the, the tongue of the fly matches perfectly with the shape of, of the flower. You get rid of this plant, this fly dies out, you get rid of the, dye, uh, the, the fly, and this, this plant dies out. That's how specialized the system is. 
So that brings up another point. Many systems are, um, they, they vary in the degree of specialization. So some systems, it's one animal and one plant species. Some, it's a couple of animals with a single plant species or a subset of animals with a subset of plants. So there are varying degrees of specialization. Some animals can visit a wide variety of plants, but no animal can visit everything. So there are, there are limitations. Our butterfly pollinated plant, notice here's the pollen on the tongue of the uh, proboscis of the butterfly. So it sticks its tongue in to get the nectar and as it, as it does that, the pollen is deposited and it deposits its tongue into different flowers and it's transferring the pollen as, as it does that. So if we took our, if let's say our bumblebee, so bumblebees visit red flowers, um, anything with nectar they'll visit. Let's say our bumblebee visits this flower, crawls up here inside to get the nectar, it completely misses the, the part with the pollen doesn't touch the, the stamens. So it's a flower visitor of that plant. And actually it's a parasite of that plant because it's taking something and not giving anything in return. Similarly, our hummingbird would come over and could get the nectar from this penstemon flower and wouldn't transfer much pollen at all. It would certainly have a much lower pollen transfer efficiency. That's the fancy term for how much pollen gets trans transferred to, um, to the stigma a lower transfer efficiency. And so plants also, not only are they trying to attract their favorite pollinators, the most efficient pollinators, they're trying to deter less efficient pollinators. So the reason that flowers are red is because hummingbirds prefer them. Hummingbirds prefer the food. This could be purple, green, whatever. The reason that this flower is red is because uh, bees can see red, but when red is um, in, in a mixed population with a flower that's blue, Bees have problems learning the color red is associated with reward. And that lag in time makes it more efficient for them to visit blue flowers. And so they avoid the red flowers, which builds up the reward that makes it our hummingbirds happy because they have lots of food and they stick with the red flowers. So there's a lot of, the, the system is, uh, these systems are very com complex, they're very interconnected. Um, and you know, the reason that we have 300,000 and 200,000 is because each one has a, a, a trick. The plants have certain floral adaptations, the animals have certain behavioral adaptations or morphological adaptations that give them the edge to compete. So the animals are competing for nectar, competing for food, and the plants are competing for their most efficient pollinator. To give you uh, an example, so many of you probably, I have to have a video so I have to come up here. Many of you probably recognize this, this flower. It's, a, it's a, a bottle gentian. Now you hear that, what that bee is doing, that bottle gentian, the, 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 the petals are fused together. And that bee is, is beating its wings at an ultra high frequency. This is Bombus vegans, one of our species at risk, that uh, has evolved with, uh, co-evolved with these, these flowers. Eventually it gets right inside the flower. You'll just see its legs sticking up. It keeps buzzing away to get in there. Now you can see it just got the nectar at the bottom of the flower. It comes out and you can see it's grouping the pollen. So the, the plant has transferred the pollen. The bee goes to um, another flower of the, of the same species, another bottle gentian flower. Only about 10% of bumblebees learn that there's a reward at the base of that flower and how to work that flower. So I'm sure you're asking, well, why is the plant making it so difficult? 90% of the bees that could be pollinators aren't there. Um, they, they, they don't even know it's there. And, and, and why, why is the plant deterring them all? The answer is because the bee that, that bee that you just saw, the amount of reward it got from this single flower visit is more than any other plant species um, in the surrounding area. So it's highly faithful to um, to this plant species, the flowers of this plant species, because it's got such a great reward. Fewer visitors means there's more, more reward per individual, and, and it's all about um, economics for the bees. The more food they get, the, the, the more likely they are to revisit. And so a lot of flowers, bumblebee pollinated flowers, are what are what's called morphologically complex. They, if there are little tricks the bee has to learn to get in to get the nectar, they're very smart, all the sensory motor learning. Um, and that's a plant adaptation to get the bees to specialize to maximize that pollen transfer efficiency that I, that I was talking about. Okay, um, so if we put all this together, we've got all these species interacting, we've got com competition on this side, we've got competition on this side, um, the forging, forging proficiency on this side, so how quickly 
they can get and efficiently they can get nectar and pollen is going to affect the reproductive success. They can leave more offspring and it's going to affect population. On this side, the pollen transfer, so we want our pollinators to go you know, for the purple flower plant species from purple to purple all the way through. That transfer efficiency equals reproductive success is going to affect the population. When we do things to affect the foraging proficiency, like adding pesticides to the environment, which um, impairs the ability of bees to make good decisions, it's going to affect their reproductive success. If they don't make good decisions, that means that they're not as good pollinators, and it's going to affect the plant side. So even though we, do, we put pesticides in the environment, it's not killing the, the pollinators outright, it's changing their behavior in a way that's reducing the foraging efficiency and reducing population and making them less efficient pollinators and reducing plant populations on this side. So you don't have to see dead bees to, to, to get decline, not just in the bees, but in, in the plants as well. And that goes for any pollinator, not, not, not just bees, but we've been studying this in, in bees. Um, Okay, so what's so the, the problem then is with this background, so we now know what a pollinator is, a flower visitor, and we know what a pollination system is. The problem is that our pollination systems are in trouble. Not just in Massachusetts and North America, but globally, those our systems, many systems are, are um, for the past decade or so, a couple of decades, they've, they've been declining. And many of them on the, are on the brink of extinction, like this one, Bombus acnus, which is um, an endangered species. Okay, let's put on the endangered species list. How do we figure out that our data systems are in trouble? In Massachusetts, we've been working on this. So what you need is historical data. You need to know what happened, what were things like you know, um, 30 years ago, and compare it to the way that things are today. So that's what we did. We, went, we, we pulled museum specimens. Uh, there were a lot of good collections, especially in western Massachusetts. And uh, we, we um, so down here we have all the different bumblebee species. Historical data is in blue. The current data, we went back to the same location and we sampled um, intensively from um, spring through, through autumn. And what we found was that many species are in a state of decline. So these, these four species are, are in a state of decline. Here with the blue bars, you can see some of them we, didn't, we haven't found. So we haven't found Aphanus, we haven't found this with Pennsylvanicus. Uh, the bee species are some uh, species that are found at higher elevations that aren't found at lower elevations. So at high elevations there are a couple of, of new species. This one, Bombus terricola, is one of them. Um, and it's in trouble. You can see that it's in decline. Uh, but what I want, want you to notice on this graph as well, you notice the red bars. Some of the red bars are higher than the blue bars here at the high elevation. And also this, this red bar actually, if, if I plotted it out, would be up here somewhere compared to the blue bar. So this idea that all pollinators are in decline is absolutely false, and it's an important point to make. There are certainly pollinators that are in, in serious trouble, but there are others, like this one, Bombus and Patience, that not only are doing, they're doing better than they've done historically, but they're also expanding their ranges. They're moving into areas where they weren't present historically. Three species weren't, uh, where this one was in low abundance, these two weren't really present at high elevations. Now they're one of the top three species that I see when I go to the field sites at, at higher elevations um, in certain areas of, of Western Mass. What this does is, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, I've, I've got tons of bees, I see tons of bees in my yard, my, bee, my yard's so bee friendly. It turns out that when I go, it's all this one species, when there should be six species there. So we, we want to separate out here the difference between abundance and the difference between diversity. Right? Diversity is what we're, are, we're, we're going for, and, and abundance um, isn't necessarily a good thing. In fact, it's an indicator that, that you're in an area that's in trouble and we need to, uh, to do something. So I'm going to come back to this point and talk about why um, this is important. It's certainly in, in the agricultural context, abundance is important, but when we talk about eco um, ecological context, biodiversity conservation, and ecosystem health, it's all about not just diversity, but what's called functional diversity. So why is it then that this diversity is so important? Remember, we've got thousands of these pollination systems. These pollination systems, when the pollination um, uh, event takes place, the products of that pollination event, so think about seeds and fruit, um, they're supplying food to this next trophic level, so this area of, of um, level of consumer. So birds are eating seeds, small mammals are eating seeds and fruit. 
the amount of individuals in the diversity at this level is feeding this level, and diversity at this level is feeding this level. So as we start removing diversity down here, eventually it's going to start to affect the food supply, and we're going to get reductions in diversity at this level. By the way, it's not just the food that's produced. Um, the plant material is used for nesting. If you're a bird, it's also used for shelter from, from the things that are trying to eat you. So there are a lot of things that um, the plant supports and the pollination event supports in, in the ecosystem. So we know we're removing connections down here. We can think of this like the foundation of a house or we can think of it like a, like a web. We start removing um, pieces of the web and eventually that foundation is, gonna, is going to um, weaken and the whole thing is going to come down and we're going to get what's called ecosystem collapse. We're going to get a massive reduction in biodiversity. We know we're removing not just the animals, but the plants from this level. What we don't know, we have no clue about how close we are to ecosystem collapse or what effect it's having, what's called a cascading effect throughout the ecosystem. And if we don't figure it out soon, the whole thing is going to collapse and you know, the, the, the same extinction is forever. We're not going to be able to build those things back up. If the species are lost, they're lost. We're not going to be able to get them back. One of the, one of the, the, the um, problems has been that people like to associate a dollar value with things. So how much is biodiversity? Like how much are we losing? Um, that this, part of this is because in an agricultural context, pollination, you can put a dollar value very easily on pollination, whether you have the crop yield you want or you don't. Here, it's, it's hard to, to assess because we don't know much about the connections. And the, the ecology project is trying to figure out connections here and also connections from the plant to this trophic level. What we do know is that we get things called ecosystem services, uh, or we rely heavily on these ecosystem services. So these are services we get from nature for free. Um, things like um, water purification, decomposition, carbon sequestration are all things that we um, uh, take for granted, to be honest. Uh, and if we lose those services, we're going to have to invent something to replace it. And it's, there's, if we can actually invent something to replace these things, it, it's going to have a, definitely have a um, price tag associated with it. So the keeping ecosystems healthy and keeping things as diverse as possible, keeping these connections together, that's, that's the goal so that we can keep these ecosystem services um, uh, you know, for years to come. All right. Now, if we look at the, um, the so I, I talked about the pollination system, and then I talked about the next trophic level that was going to um, be supported by those interactions between the animals and the plants. Collectively, we're, we call those uh, pollination networks. So we've got the pollinator plant interaction and then things interacting with the plant that's helping them to, to survive. What we tend to see now is the focus is on pollinators. Last week was the pollinator week, right? And I suggest that the name be changed to Pollination System Week because in, in, in everything that I read and all of the events, the plant side of it was lost. And, and so why does this matter? So if we focus on pollinators, this is, this is um, a, an example that I think illustrates the point. A lot of us have hummingbird feeders, which is fine. We put out our hummingbird feeders and we, we, we uh, think we're saving the, the hummingbirds. We see tons of hummingbirds. And if you're a hummingbird, and you have to go out and find your food, and you have to visit all these different flowers that have small amounts of nectar, and it takes a long time, and you have to do a lot of work versus one-stop shopping over here, what do, you, what do you think you're going to do? You're going to go over here. When you do that, what's going to happen to the plants and reproduction? Nothing, right? And I can guarantee you, if you put out a feeder versus these plants, the birds are going to take the feeders because they're not stupid. They're going to take the, the easiest thing to, to get. And so here we're focused on uh, helping the pollinators. We can, we can give them uh, sugar water and you know, the, the, they'll mate and they'll raise young and they'll continue on. But in terms of connecting to the ecosystem, we have removed the connection. So it's far better to plant monarda or to plant cardinal flower. And you don't have to plant much. If you, were to, if you have you know, from here to the wall with monarda, that's enough to support a male and uh, a female, a nesting female, and, and she'll put out a couple of offspring. Versus this, and the added benefit is that you are also supplying seeds and food and, and that um, plant material that's supporting the rest of the ecosystem and the biodiversity. You aren't supporting anything 
um, on this side except for one species, whereas here, you're not just supporting the native plant, but everything that's associated with that, with that native plant. <coughs> Comparing then the abundance and diversity, and now I want to introduce the idea of functional diversity. So, um, through an example. So here's abundance. This is one bumblebee species. It's got a medium tongue length, so the functional groups, you've got short, medium, and long tongue bees. So this represents one functional group that's medium tongue bees, and it's one species. So here we've increased diversity. We've got three different bumblebee species. All of them have medium tongue. So it's three species, but one functional group. So we've increased diversity, but our functional diversity remains the same. When we go over here, we see we've got three different types of animals, three different tongue lengths and different systems. So we've got short, medium, and long tongue animals here, three species, and we've got three functional groups. So here we've got the same diversity, but here we also have functional diversity. Within bumblebees, they come in short, medium, and long tongue species as well. So we have three functional groups here and three species. This functional group is the one that's in trouble. Most of the plant lists that you see out there today are supporting these two functional groups that aren't in trouble. They're common and they're doing very well. We're not targeting the ones that we should. So we really need to start thinking in terms of functional diversity and the range of different plant um, animal uh, interactions, those pollination systems that we have. We need to really focus on the ones that are threatened because we're missing a whole branch of that, that web that I showed you in the ecosystem. The long tongue that, that starts with the long tongue bees and the long the tubular flowers. That that match um, is what we're missing, and so we need to target and figure out those matches and, and how to get that that side back. Certainly, this is better than this, but all of these species are common. So what happens is, if if you throw in a few more plant species, you're going to increase this, but the things that are up, you're going to miss. You're going to miss this one. So we need to really focus on, on that. And similarly with the butterflies. So with butterflies, they have host plants, right? They they lay their eggs on specific plants. Like a monarch needs milkweed. The larvae eat milkweed. If you give them anything else, they're going to die. They're not going to eat anything else. They're they're extreme specialists at the larva stage. There are many butterflies that are like that, or, or feed on a subset of things. Putting out uh, uh, plants with um, flowers that attract butterflies isn't going to do any good if you don't have the host plant because they're never going to get to the adult stage. So a true functional garden would have the host plants and have the nectaring plants together. Most people are just putting in the nectar plants and forgetting about the host plants. Um, and so that's, that's what I mean by increasing the functional diversity. Thinking about every stage of the life cycle for these different species, particularly the species that are, that are in trouble. So if we look, as I mentioned, this functional group, the long tongue bees, and these, these bees actually are the ones that are in trouble, the Bombus avenus, the one in the endangered species list, they have really short tongues. So why is it that I'm saying that long tongue bees are in trouble? Because these two bees have a special behavior called nectar robbing. They target tubular flowers, like this one. This is uh, jewel weed, touch me not. The nectar is located at the base of the spur. The long tongue bees love it because they have their long tongue that comes down to get the nectar at the base of the spur. Short tongue bees can't get that nectar. These two species evolve the behavior where they come in and they start biting a hole at the base of the flower and they steal the nectar with their short tongues. So they're piggybacking on the um, on these the, the long tongue species. So we've got our, our Bombus furbitus that's going in and pollinating the plant and uh, these ones evolve behaviors that they can come in and exploit the system. And the system is, is in, in what's called a, an evolutionary stable state, where we've got these things that can, that can coexist. The problem is, when they bite holes, it opens up the resource to everything else that doesn't bite holes. So all the short, medium ton bees, including honeybees. So what you see is that once they bite the holes, everybody else starts using the holes, and if they're, if they're um, like honeybees are in the thousands, they're taking all the nectar before these ones can even get to the holes that they're biting. Because once you bite the hole, you can't cover it back up again and come back later. Um, but all of these bees, have, uh, uh, um, they are looking for these tubular flowers so that they can use their special behavior. Today, I was out doing a survey in uh, Savoy in Western Mass. Saw this species uh, all over the place, and it was robbing uh, red clover. 
So red clover has a very long flower, a uh, um, long tube. And um, this species loves it, and another one, Bombus borealis. So we see this species. This one, you could barely see the bee. It was at the base of the flower, like way down at the bottom of the flower, biting holes at the base of that flower so that it could feed on these two different flowers. There were many composites in the field. This bee was not on any one of them because it, it's got a specialized skill and it forms a, a search image and it's looking for this type of flower, so we need to give it that type of flower. That's for nectar. For pollen, bees are using different types of plants for pollen than they are for nectar. So for pollen, um, they're using things like the native roses, they're using meadowsweet. You know, as I said, I have a plant list and I can tell you the plants that they're using for pollen versus nectar. But it's a different resource um, altogether. And the Becology Project is trying to figure out the, the range of plants that rely on these bees and also what they're using as a, as a, source, of, um, a source of pollen. More videos. So to illustrate this point, so here's our red clover. Um, so here, this is um, Bombus impatiens, the, the common one, that's forging for nectar on um, goldenrod. See its, its tongue, proboscis sitting out, just walking along the top of the flower, poking to, to get the nectar. In the fall, when goldenrod's in bloom, you see tons of insects all over goldenrod. Why? Because the nectar is easily accessible. If we look over here, we've got um, linaria, butter and eggs, toad flax. The nectar is on this one. It's located at the base of this long spike. This is Bombus firmus, one of our threatened species. You see it has to pry open the petals on the top of the flower, crawl inside, and it uses its long tongue to get to the nectar at the base of that long tube. Obviously, it's using a dish. Um, so the species with long tongues, they don't visit this type. You'll never see a fervidus on goldenrod because its tongue gets in the way. It can't compete with short to medium tongue bees. Similarly, these bees that don't bite holes You'll, you won't see them on this type of flower because their tongues are too short. So effectively, this flower does not contain reward because their tongue, they can't reach the reward. Um, and so that, that's how things have been separated out. So we can plant all of this type of flower that we want, hundreds of species, we're not going to help this one at all. Um, and, and so, you know, again, the honeybee has a, a medium to, to short tongue and most, a lot of other bees do. So this is tends to get planted, um, but we really need to start to focus more on, on things with the, um, with the tubes. All right, so it's not just the interaction, as I said, it's these other things. And to, and to give you an example, here's milkweed. So we've got our monarch larvae feeding on the leaves, so it's a host plant. We've got our bees that are collecting nectar, a subset of bees collecting nectar on the flowers. We have birds that like to eat bees, and we have birds that like to eat uh, larvae. We also have the products of the pollination, the seeds, um, and uh, so the, you know we have animals eating the seeds, or using the products of that pollination event to, to build nests or, or do whatever. So just by planting milkweed, we're helping all of these these different species, and in some cases those species might be threatened. So we could help threaten bees, we can help threaten butterflies and threaten birds. We just have to figure out how those things are connected um, through the plant, which is the focus of the the ecology project. Now, this ecological side of things, just to, to give you the other side that's, that's received a lot of attention since 2006, that's when, when colony collapse disorder was described in, in honeybees, we have a whole other system that's equally important to what I just talked about. Um, it's just very different, but it's equally important. Instead of bees figuring things out on their own, we have man, what are called managed bees. So our honeybees, obviously, uh, we give them a place to live, we treat them for disease, we feed them if, if the, the flowers aren't abundant, we mate them. Um, and there are a couple of native species, so Bombus and Patients, there's a bumblebee that's used to pollinate certain things and other uh, leafcutter bees and other bees that are used to pollinate certain things. So we have a subset of bee species. Some are native, the honeybee is not native to, to North America. So a handful of bees, remember, compared to thousands of different species that we have on the ecological side, that are pollinating a handful of, of plants that aren't native plants, they may be derived from native plants, but there's a handful of plants, supplying food to a single species. 
us. Obviously, it's one important species, but it's still a single species. And if we could throw livestock in here, I guess, as well. Um, but um, in this context, it's, it's, diversity doesn't matter, right? All we need are enough bees to, to pollinate all of the flowers you see here in the picture. And given there are a lot of them, but there are 10 to 20,000 bees in this honey bee, one honeybee hive alone. So once they're done pollinating, that, that's, that's the, their job's done. So the, what matters here is abundance. And any conservation that you do to, to maximize pollination of crop plants is focused on abundance, not diversity. Diversity doesn't matter. In fact, of the thousands of species that are important ecologically, only about 5% of them, of our native pollinator species, visit crop plants. The vast majority don't. That means they have no economic value. So when it comes to conserving, who do you think is not going to be included in the, in the conservation strategy and that's the threatened species? Because they're not, what, what matters here is the abundance and the common species like this one that are in the thousands in the wild. Um, and so we really need to think about those threatened species and really target them. Now we can do that on agricultural lands and we're doing that in Western Mass. It just is going to take a completely different, different approach. If we put the honeybee into the ecological context, so I said 5% of native bees or so uh, visit crop plants, honeybees, if we remove them from North America, it would have zero effect on biodiversity and ecosystem function. In fact, some would argue it would have a positive effect because they're competitors and it's a limited resource. Nectar and pollen are that's a limited resource. You've got thousands of species competing for the for a limited resource, you're going to have winners and, and, and losers. So honeybees are extremely important in this context. But in terms of biodiversity conservation, they, they don't have a place there. Um, and so we need to keep those two things separate if we're going to truly save, save the bees. We have to, to, to think outside, outside the box and we have to think more ecologically. And this involves understanding what the needs of the different species are at every stage of the life cycle. So for the monarch butterfly, they need milkweed at the larval stage and they need nectar plants at the adult stage. For bumblebees, they have an annual colony of the queens, Hibernate, you know, like bears through the winter. They can be, uh, they have an antifreeze. They can be um, chilled. They can um, below freezing, uh, withstand below freezing temperatures. Um, once they come out in the spring, they have to find a nest site. Once they find a nest site, they have to find enough pollen. They lay eggs in the ball of pollen. The larvae eat the pollen. The queen continues to feed the larvae. Eventually, the workers emerge. The workers need to find more pollen to make more workers and eventually make males and queen bees that need to find each other and mate. And then the mated queen finds a place to overwinter and the first or second hard frost, everybody else dies. So only the queens, the mated queens, survive the winter in bumblebees. So if we don't find a hibernation site, the population is going to go down. If we don't find nest sites, the population is going to go down. If we don't find pollen to lay our, our, our eggs and a lump of pollen, the population goes down. If the males can't find the, the, the queens, the population goes down. All of these different components of the, of the life cycle are equally important, but we tend to focus on throwing flowers out here instead of providing nest site and overwintering sites. And the reason is because we don't know much about what goes on here at the species level and part of the Ecology Project. The goal of the Ecology Project is to figure, figure that out. Okay, so how is it that we determine the decline mechanisms? Um, So, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> stroke effect. Here are the, uh, this is showing you the, the, all the bumblebee species historically that were present in Massachusetts. So I have a handout with this, this is the workers, and I have a, a worker and the other side of this is males. So when you go home and you're out in your, your garden or you're, you're taking a walk, you can see um, what, what species you have in your area. Here are the species that are at risk. And here are the species that have increased in abundance and are um, have that increased distribution. So, you know, think, remembering back to the, the figure that, that I showed you. So, what is it that's causing the declines in these species, and what's causing these species to increase and, and um, expand their range? There are a number of factors that have been proposed. And it's likely a combination of factors, and it likely depends on where you are. So if you're in an urban or agricultural area, um, pesticides, you know, we've heard a lot about neonicotinoids, and, and we're, we're, our lab's studying all of these different factors. 
Um, when, when things started in the early 2000s, we thought it was this one, infectious agents. Um, we thought that diseases were brought over from Europe with the commercial bee industry and then spread to wild populations, causing some to decline. It then shifted to pesticides after colony collapse, the sort of just described. But I think everybody agrees that, that habitat change, habitat loss, introduction of non-native plant species are, uh, play some role, so we're focused there, and then also climate change. What climate change does is, as I mentioned, we've got the animals and the plants that are, are linked up together, they're in sync. And what climate change what does is it puts them out of sync. So early in the spring, willow is absolutely important. If there's one thing that you should plant in your yard, it's willow. And if you have willow, don't mow it. Let it go, because that's what, not just bumblebees, but all bees in the spring, willow is their main source of food. Um, so what happens is, if, let's say the willow is in and out of bloom before the bees come out of hibernation. They're coming out looking for food, there's no food there. The willow also doesn't get pollinated because those two things are out of sync. So that's, that's how climate change um, works, to put things to, to put things out of sync. Climate change can also, if it's too warm, the bees don't get chilled to the point where they start looking for nests. Um, and so we're, we're examining all, all of these different things in the lab. But today I'm going to focus more on the habitat because <clears throat> what, you know, so that you can go home with the plant list and, 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 and actually um, help, help things, help to increase that, that functional diversity that, uh, that I'm talking about. Uh, the, so as I said, our lab's working on all those different things and the, um, in terms of collecting ecological data on the overwintering sites, the nest sites, and the, and the foraging habitat, um, that's, that's where you come in. So the citizen scientists, uh, you know, back in 2016, I was doing collect, I noticed some interesting things about the um, bumblebee plant relationships at the species level, and I needed more data. And there's no way that I was going to be able to go out and collect data um, from across the state. Um, and so I thought, how could I do this? And I thought, well, citizen scientists, so the bumblebees are one thing. Bumblebees are very easy to identify, especially in, in Massachusetts and other areas. There are some species that are a bit, um, a bit more challenging. But here, it's you know, with a little bit of practice, and I run workshops to, to teach people how to do this, um, you can figure out what the species is. And so people were sending me videos and pictures, and then I had to go through them all and then turn them into the database, and that was a lot of trouble. And so I thought, well, WPI isn't, one of its strengths is in ecology. I was the only ecologist there, but it has, definitely has a strength in technology and computer science. So I said, okay, computer scientists, help me out. Can we do an app where we can record a bee plant interaction and then get that information into a database? And I said, oh, yeah, no problem. And from that, we created the web app and also this, this ecology project where we have these visualization tools and there's, you know, these workshops that I give, we go over, I go over everything and teach you how to use different things and I don't, don't have time to do that. But please visit uh, ecology.wpi.edu and, you know, check out the site. A lot of what I'm talking about today you'll find in the Learn tab and you'll also find the web app um, there. And if you click on web app, there are some videos telling you how to use the app. And you certainly can email me or ask me to run a workshop and I can go through all of these things with you. Um, but it's, it's been amazing, um, you know, the amount of data that, that I've been able to collect uh, through this project that continues to grow um, this year. We already have a, a ton of data. We found rare species. It's just, it's just really, really become a bit amazing. So the web app allows me then to collect data um, from across the state. So everybody in the state would just log what's in their yard uh, a couple times a year. Very quickly, I'd have enough data to figure out what's going on and what the needs of those species in decline um, are. The other thing we have, it's a public, publicly accessible database that's at this point at WPI. Um, but the other thing, if you go to the website, we have these visualization tools. So you can pull up a map of the state. This, this is a heat map showing diversity. So you can click on one of these uh, boxes. Uh, over your area, and you can see all the species that were present in your area um, at, at any time period. So we've got museum specimens, so you can look at historical data, and you can look at current data, and you can compare those two things to see um, the species that are have increased or decreased in, in abundance in your area, and then focus on, on trying to get those species back. We also have um, what's called the bipartite graph. We have our bumblebee species here and our plant species. You can click on a bumblebee species, and you can look at 
the plant species it was observed on to see what it likes to visit. You can click on the plant species and see which bumblebee species it would attract. And you can use these different filters for pollen and nectar, and there are a lot of different things you can do. On the other side of this ecology project, there's, uh, we're developing high school curriculum uh, based on this project combining biology and computer science. That's called the BioCS Bridge. Um, and so we have funding through NSF to do that. So these tools are also being brought into, into high school, into the high school curriculum um, to help to pe teach people about, uh, kids about, uh, high school students about biodiversity and ecosystem function and modeling and, and various things. So success stories, there have been quite a few and actually um, in this room actually this year this is one of our species that's in rapid decline. I was checking the, the locks for this year, and sure enough, the species showed up three times from this area. Um, and uh, I was pleasantly surprised, so I will be back here uh, because this species is here. We're, we're, we're trying to study it and find populations. It's very difficult to find the species in good numbers in the state. Um, so this is Bombus fertus. This species, when I started the project, the state told me that it, it, it was no longer present in the state. They, they said it's been extirpated, and so I was giving one of these talks, and at the end of the talk, somebody came up to me and showed me a picture and said, isn't this the bee that you're, you're looking for? And I said, yes, where did you see that? And, and they said, oh, I took this at Bridge of Flowers a, a couple weeks ago. And so since that time, this, this species is alive and well in Western Mass in many areas. I was just out there today at one of my field sites and saw around 20 of them at one site, which is amazing, saw queens in the spring, and so I now, because of through the Ecology Project, have a range map, and I have sites where I can study the species and figure out what it likes, and I'm trying to bring it into areas where it's no longer present through what's called a pollination uh, pollinator corridor. So you're, you you can you know where it is. You're going to build these these bridges into areas and help it to expand its range by putting in the plants that it likes. Um, this species, there were only two of them reported in the state between 1900 and, and 1990. Um, I saw 20 on a single plant at Wigan a Prayer Nursery in, in Cummington, Mass. I saw probably close to 50 today when I was out at, at one of my field sites. So this species is has really increased in in um, in number. This one's doing pretty well. This one's in trouble. This one just got listed as a threatened species, and for whatever reason, they decided not to list this one, even though this one I see one of, or two of field season, and I, as I said, I saw 20 in a single visit. I don't know the people making the decisions. I put my two cents in to try to get this one listed, but they uh, ignored me. I don't know why. I don't know. I'm not important enough yet, I guess. Uh, anyway, so how is it that we're going to we know that these species are around. There are a lot of projects out there, bumblebee watch in the, in the country, that are bee spotter, that are, are mapping out where these different species are. But if you see them in one area, not another area, the question is, why is it not in this area? And they can't answer that question. And it floored me that people are studying and, and putting out um, bowls to try to collect bees, and they pin them, and they say, OK, look at the diversity in this area. And we don't have any diversity over here. Um, and so the question is, well, why? But because they just studied the animal, they, they didn't study what the animal was actually doing. What was it feeding on? Or what, what, are, what are the habitat differences? They, they have no clue about mechanism. So the Becology Project, the main goal is to try to fill in that gap. What is it? So the plant that the bee is interacting with is just as important as the bee um, from my perspective. And so how is it that we, get, we learn about these interactions? We have to go out to the field and we have to do surveys. So we, I can go out and walk um, in, a, in an area. So we, we, here's Breakneck Hill in South Borough. It's about 40 acres. We drop transects and we just walk the transects. And I can I walk through and ID bees. And you know, when you get good at it, you don't have to even net them. Most of the time, you can see what what it is and you sort of move through. We do surveys from June through October. This year, we pushed it back to April because we want to know what the queens are up to. And so for every bumblebee we see, we ID the species. Is it a queen worker or a male bee? Is it nectar or pollen foraging? So this is the behavior. It's very important to know what it's doing. What is the plant species that it's on? You know, what's the overall flower abundance? So what's, what's in bloom but it's not visiting? That's just as important as what it is visiting. Is it an exotic or native plant? And then what are the general habitat characteristics? Is it agricultural land? Are we in grassland? Are we in, in wetland? 
So we have a number, I'll show you data for a few sites. So we have some sites out in Heath, Savoy, uh, Wachusa Meadow, and um, Breakneck Hill in, um, in Southborough. So we did this for a few years. And, and um, so just looking at the preferences for nectar. So we look at here are the bumblebee species uh, down here and uh, the proportion of visits to different species. So at one site, we observed 25, a bumblebee on 25 different plant species, all right? But if we look at what each species was visiting, notice that the vast majority of them are only visiting two, maybe three species out of the 25. More, more than, well more than half, more than 60% of their visits are to just two things, possibly three things, for nectar. And if we look, divide them up to short tongue, medium tongue, and long tongue species, not surprisingly, the long tongue bees are visiting veg and red clover, where you need a long tongue to get the nectar. Uh, the medium tongue bees are visiting things with um, sort of intermediate to short tubes, and the short tongue bees are visiting things like goldenrod um, and milkweed that, that have um, that they have, they have no to. They're very easy to, to access the nectar. But what I want to point out here is that notice that within each group, there's a lot of variation in what they visit. So it isn't just about tongue length. There's something else. So look at bombus and patients. It loves, um, it, it was actually on vetch, larger individuals, um, and it was on dog bane, but it didn't touch milkweed versus this species that's, that loves milkweed. So if you see anything on milkweed, odds are it's going to be this bumblebee species. There is some sort of relationship between Brissia colis and, and milkweed. Um, similarly here, Bombus perplexus loves bush uh, honeysuckle. And the Bombus Brissia colis that were foraging on milkweed were avoiding this plant species. So all of these species are all present at the same time, yet we're seeing this subdivide, this partitioning of resources. The question is why, and our hypothesis is that there are components, chemicals in the nectar that are attracting and also deterring the most effective pollinator. And so I'm working with somebody from Cornell to figure out what is it in the nectar that, um, you know, Bombus borealis or Bombus bagans likes. What's in bush honeysuckle nectar that's attracting Bombus bagans? Because then we can get more plants like that to try to you know, support the, the Bombus bagans populations, which, and that's one of the species that, that's in trouble. When we look at the plant species for pollen, so this is where the bees were actively collecting pollen, 25 species, but they were only collecting pollen from two species, St. John's wort and meadowsweet. So this, so the, you know, the, the bees are going to tell us what they like. Like we don't, we're, we, we're not going to tell the bees what they like because they're not going to visit it. They tell us, and they're telling us for whatever reason they love St. John's wort and meadowsweet. At other study sites, the native roses, the purple flowering raspberries, things in the rose family, bees, bumblebees love them for nectar, for um, sorry, for pollen. And so what we see is that the bees are visiting some flowers for nectar and some flowers for pollen. The, the, the nectar flowers separate out by tongue length and some other properties, but everybody is using the same flowers for pollen. This creates a limited resource, so if we reduce the amount of St. John's wort in an area, we're going to get intense competition and we're going to get some species winning and some species losing. The ones that are winning clearly are the ones that are increasing, and the ones that are losing are the ones that are going extinct. So we need to really focus on pollen plants, and we're really, this year, um, <clears throat> You know, we've expanded our study sites. We're looking for more plants that they're actively collecting pollen. We certainly see bees with pollen when they're collecting nectar, um, but that pollen is likely used to help to construct the colony. It's not being fed to the larva. The good stuff is fed to the larva. The stuff that they get just while they're um, collecting nectar is probably used to um, to build the nest. And we're testing that hypothesis as well. The other interesting thing is that male bees and worker bees have different preferences. So you see, and queens. So in the same area, you'll have queens and workers. The queens will be on this thing, and the workers will be over here on something completely different. And then when the males come out, the males and workers don't overlap as well. So it's, it's much more complex than people say. And, and you know, the, 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 the going, well, I'll show you some um, plant lists. But there's this idea out there that one size fits all. The bumblebees are generalists, they'll visit anything, just put it out there and they will come. And that's absolutely false. And we have, I have tons of data to show that, 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 um, that that's the case. 
to give you an example, this is from pollinator.org. So one of the this is one of the many lists that's out there for what do I put in my garden to help save save pollinators to make a pollinator friendly. Notice that not just bumblebees, but all of those bee groups where I told you there were hundreds of species, they just have bumblebees all grouped together. And I showed you that red clover was important. And here, red clover isn't even checked. And I also told you that rose was important, and it is checked, but it's not identified as an important pollen plant. Right? The pollen nectar separation just, just doesn't exist because people aren't thinking about it that way. And that's the shift that we need to make. We need to start thinking about um, the, the needs of, of the diff at the species level more compre comprehensively throughout the, throughout the life cycle. Okay. Um, Quickly, looking at exotic species, so you know a lot of you are, are probably gardeners and, and um, you know thinking about what to plant. Um, the difference between a native and a non-native, and then you have native cultivars. So I was at Bridge of Flowers today. My the first time I was actually at Bridge of Flowers, thinking well, I'm going to see trickle and all these bees. I walked Bridge of Flowers three times back and forth. I saw one bumblebee, and there were uh, probably a hundred things in bloom. Why? Because they're all cultivars. And what happens is when you breed something for show, you breed the nectar out of it. Right? So the plant has limited resources. If you want a flower that's showy, you have to give up resources from somewhere else. And, and most of the time that, that, that's from the nectar. Right? So we have, and I, I've run into this myself doing experiments. I bought aconitum flowers and the bees wouldn't touch them. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Sure enough, they weren't producing any nectar because it was, it was a cultivar. So, um, that's, that's one issue. A bigger issue, though, is with invasives. And, and um, like Japanese knotweed and oriental bittersweet. Basically what you're doing with these species is you're putting up a parking lot. And, um, and, and you're, just, you're choking out all of the native diversity. This is a, a picture taken from Chesterfield Gorge. There was a road that they had to cut in, so the river is over here. They had to cut in a road up to um, a hiking trail area. Um, there are green walls of Japanese knotweed and oriental bittersweet on either side. Where they cut the road, notice there's just a sea of color where they cut back those invasives. And, and here, the riparian meadows, when I was uh, at Chesterfield Gorge a couple of years ago, uh, noticing some threatened species in the area, was, was, was um, surveying this riparian meadow. The next year, half of it was covered with Japanese knotweed. And um, there's, there's not, the plants that were there are, are no longer there because the Japanese knotweed took over. Now these, these invasives do bloom, and a lot of people say, well, I see bees all over it. It's, it's helping them. It's helping one species, the common species. It's not helping the threatened species, and it's also helping honeybees. So um, the, 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 um, the native species are picky eaters, and a lot of them prefer native plants. So here we are again. Here are native bumblebee species. Here is um, percent visits to exotics, percent visits to natives. These three species primarily visit natives. When I see them, they're, they're all visiting natives. These ones like non-natives, so cow vetch and red clover, they aren't invasive, but they're non-native, exclusively visiting those two things. Um, this is that one study site. Um, they do visit natives with similar properties at other sites. But what I want to point out here is that purple loosestrife Bombus and patience, that most common species that I talked about that's all over the place, that's increased in number and expanding its range, loves purple loosestrife, but none of these other species, not one of them, was observed on purple loosestrife. So thousands of individuals on loosestrife, but not a single one of hundreds of other species on that loosestrife. And so what I wondered was, what if I remove the loosestrife? At this site, it was late in the summer and it was dominated by one species and we're trying to bring back diversity. Thought that maybe competition because of the loose strife and, and increasing impatience number might have something to do with it. So what we did was we removed the loose strife. This is, so th this is the 40 acres. It's covered with um, Joe, uh, Joe Pieweed, with um, Meadow Sweet, with Blue Burbank, Dogbane, and, and um, several species of Goldenrod, native Goldenrod. All through all of this area, the loose stripe is located near a community garden down here. So we're not talking about very much. So we removed that, and what we found was that, so here are worker bumblebees, here are the bumblebee species. This is before loose stripe removal. All of these bees, all this red is, visit, is um, visits to loose stripe. 
When we removed it, look at the shift. It flipped over and those, those patients started visiting the native plants. Even more dramatic was in the males. The males seem to prefer loose strife in these other species. The workers don't touch it, but the males do. Remove the loose strife, look at all of the increase in, in uh, visits to native plant species. So what are we talking about here in terms of numbers of visits? We're talking, you know, three, four hundred percent increase in visits. So this is pre-loose strife removal. This is post-loose strife removal. Visits to goldenrod, meadowsweet, ver um, dogbane. What? And so, even if these species don't necessarily need the pollination services, think about the seeds that are produced through the pollination event. If you have birds that only visit, they don't like loose strife. And there is um, good evidence that that um, animals don't like to nest in loose strife. Uh, native birds, they don't like to eat uh, loose strife um, seeds. By releasing the, or, or moving the, the bees onto the natives, you're providing seeds and nest, nest sites for all of these birds and helping them out. So it isn't, it isn't just about the, what the bees visiting, it's about the impact it's having on, on, the, um, on the native plants. So what do we do with all of the data that we have once we get it? What we need to do is we need to start developing these lists. I talked about this list. Um, just to give you another example, um, you know, if you Google bee-friendly seed mixes, uh, these are the first two that came up, so I'm not picking on them at all. Um, but we, we look at the flowers here, what do we notice? They're all composites. There are no tubular flowers, long tubular flowers for those long ten bees. There are no, I can tell you there are no pollen plants over here. So this is a wasteland for bumblebees. A lot of these species actually were, I noticed, were at um, Bridge of Flowers today. This seed mix does a bit better job. So this one, yes, some long tongue bees will visit this, but there isn't a single pollen plant on here um, that, that bumblebees like for pollen. So if they don't have a pollen source, they can't make new bees. Bees need pollen to make more bees. So they may have nectar, and this is only for a short period. They need nectar from April all the way through um, October. So this isn't going to cut it. The, the long tongue bees aren't going to visit these flowers, as I said. Bumblebees, you know, I, I've yet to see a bumblebee visiting visiting um, um, this plant species. So, I, you know, we need more evidence. We need more data to, to construct um, better uh, plant lists. Uh, this is a habitat. The, the point I wanted to make here is that in the spring, I told you that willow was extremely important. Golden Alexanders um, definitely aren't supplying uh, nectar or pollen to any of these bees. Uh, even the wild lupine and blue, blue indigo, um, they, they will visit that for, for nectar, but there are no pollen plants here. This is, we're already in early summer, and on this entire list, there's a single pollen plant on this list. So they're getting low quality pollen, and that's certainly going to uh, affect the population. And this is not targeting these long tongue bees. So it's we really need to change the way that we, we do things. And how do we how do we do that? Um, we need to start thinking about the connections. And and so based on our data, we know that wild roses, Virginia rose and Carolina rose, all of the threatened species have been observed actively collecting pollen on these uh, roses. The roses are also host plant to the apple sphinx moth. Eastern whippoorwills um, are, are a threatened species. They would be uh, benefiting from the addition of the, um, these wild uh, native roses into the habitat. The rose hips are going to feed all the birds listed here. So just by planting the, the, the combination of the Carolina and the Virginia rose, you're supplying pollen for threatened species here, and you're likely helping out threatened species that like to eat larvae or insects or like to eat um, the, the, the products of that, that um, pollination event. Similarly, for wild yellow indigo, and this, this is a big one because the wild yellow indigo is host plant for two threatened butterfly species in the state. It also is a highly preferred nectar source for Bombus bagans and Bombus firmidus, those the two species, bumblebee species at risk. And um, again, there are um, the bird species at risk that are either seed eaters or they are insect eaters. They love a nice um, you know, um, um, butterfly larva. Is you know a lot of protein in there. 
And so just by planting this, and in combination with the rows, you're helping out all of these threatened species. So we need to start thinking about these networks that I was talking about, the connections. To do that, we need to get a better understanding of the interactions here, the interactions over here, so and the interactions here. So what I'm doing is working with, um, or getting information from the Massachusetts Butterfly um, Club, figuring out what the host plants are, and what are some species that have a large effect. They're host plants to threatened species, and they're also serving the nectar and pollen needs of the threatened bumblebee species. Then working with Mass Audubon to see how birds are using, what are they eating, do they prefer certain um, um, butterfly species, for example, or certain insect species, what plants would we put in to help them to, um, to, to get food. Uh, so how do we use the ecology uh, project in our own backyard? So I have uh, the handout for native plants. So if you're thinking about planting something, you can look at the plant list that I have. That again, it's all based on data. I have put these plants in my own backyard last year. As soon as the, the native rose started blooming, I saw Bombus vagans collecting pollen. I hadn't seen the vagans anywhere in the, in the neighborhood. I had surveyed the entire neighborhood, including Garden in the Woods. Um, and, um, and it just shows up. So I know that, that, that the plants on the, on the list will do their, will do their job. The other is that you can start collecting data. So all you need to do is to take a 10 to 15 second video of a bumblebee or what you think is a bumblebee interacting with a flower and you can either use the app if you go to the website or if you don't want to use the app you can just put the video into a Google Drive folder or Flickr and send me a link and I'd be happy to ID it for you and, um, and the plant and put it into the database for you. Um, if, if that works for you. If you think that you have a habitat and you think you've seen these threatened species and you don't like cell phones or any technology and you want me to come, come and take a look, I can do a survey on your property. And all, any, any way that you can contribute, I'll, I'm very accommodating and I'd love to get, um, to get uh, help, uh, any, any form of help um, that, you, that you're willing to, to, um, willing to get. And with that, I would like to um, thank you for your time, thank the people, partners, and you know, hopefully you'll be on this list for the next talk or two that I give. Uh, if you need to ask me any questions, or, or you can reach me at um, rgr at umassd.edu, that's my new email address, and then you can go to the Ecology website um, to get access to the app and the videos. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you very much. For your